thank you very much. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, Federico Fernandez and, and, and Basies for inviting me here again. Uh, some of you may know I was here back in 2004. I think it was actually your first conference back in 2004. And I, I did several presentations. I talked about, um, oh, I presented uh, a criticism of uh, uh, authority, community, and bureaucracy as the um, enemies of the open society. That, that was very well received. Um, I talked about uh, criticism of uh, uh, the institutionalist theory of science, which was also very well received. And, and then I, I gave a third paper called The Poverty of Economism, um, which was my criticism of, of Hayek uh, for being as economistic as, as Marx and economism on the right as opposed to economism on the left. And, and that wasn't so well received. Um, that, that was 12 years ago, and we've had several conferences since and I'm happy that you invited me to this one. And I just wanted to tell you that story in, in case after the paper we never see each other again. Uh, I, what I want to do is to talk about differences between Karl Popper and Friedrich Hayek's theories of democracy and open society, or perhaps I should say their concepts of democracy and open society. So, this is what this is about. It, it's actually from my last book called Hayek and Popper. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hayek and Popper on, on uh, rationality, democracy, and open society, uh, where I argue, amongst other things, that um, they differed about rationality, economism, and open society, and that Popper's views were decidedly preferable for people who were really concerned about liberty and freedom. So let me begin. Karl Popper and Friedrich von Hayek are widely regarded as two of the 20th century's greatest proponents of democracy and open society. And their ideas about them, with some reason, are often regarded as more or less the same. But the terms democracy and open society mean different things to different people. And my sense is that neither of them would be regarded as strong proponents, let alone defenders, of democracy and open society in the way in which most people seem to understand these terms today. Neither Popper nor Hayek regarded democracy as an end in itself. They defended it, on the contrary, as a means to preserve freedom in open society. Neither of them, more importantly, were proponents of popular sovereignty or majority rule. But that's not the main part of my story. Popper and Hayek no doubt agreed about many things pertaining to democracy and open society, and I don't want anything that I say today to lead you to think otherwise. But in what follows, I will argue that they actually had very different concepts of democracy and open society. So different that Hayek proposed electoral reforms that would have transformed a Popperian democracy into a form of government that he would have had to regard as a tyranny. Hayek's ideas about legal and political change, moreover, raised questions about whether and to what extent he was actually a proponent of what Popper regarded as open society at all. And in what follows, I'll try to explain these ideas in greater detail. Now, most people who value democracy regard it as majority rule. And indeed, they value it because they value majority rule. They may think that democracy means rule by the people, and that rule by the people means rule by the majority of the people. They may think that rule by the majority of the people is better than rule by a king or a dictator, or that the majority is always right, or that the whole point of democracy, and indeed government more generally, is to act in the best interest of the people, who are, again, the majority. They may believe that in order to act in the best interest of the people, we must first determine what the best interests of the people actually are, 
and that asking the majority what it thinks is in the best interest of the people is the best way to do it. Or they may simply believe that majority rule is a good in itself, which apparently is what many theorists today believe. It's a good in and of itself and should thus be pursued whenever and wherever possible as an end in itself for its own sake, not only when making political decisions, but when also in deciding where to eat or go to vacation or go to the movies. Hayek believed that democracy means majority rule, but he did not share any of the other beliefs I just mentioned. He did not think that majority rule is good in itself or an end in itself. He did not value it for its own sake. And he did not believe that the majority is always right or always wise or that it should always get its way about any and all things. He wrote, he wrote one may have profound respect for the convention of arriving at political decisions via majority rule, but little respect at all for the wisdom of the majority. He wrote, I firmly believe that government ought to be conducted according to principles approved by a majority of the people and must be so run if we are to preserve peace and freedom. But he also wrote, if democracy is taken to mean government by the unrestricted will of the majority, I am not a Democrat and even regard such government as pernicious and in the long run, unworkable. Popper, on the other hand, did not believe that, major that democracy is majority rule at all. He said that democracy has never been and neither can nor should be ruled by the people. He even thought that there is a danger in teaching that democracy is ruled by the people, since the people will feel deceived and cheated and become disillusioned with democracy when they discover that it's not. Democracies, he said, are not popular sovereignties, but above all, institutions equipped to defend themselves from dictatorship. He said that democracies do not permit dictatorial rule and accumulation of power, but seek to limit the power of the state. And he thought that the role of the people in a democracy is not to rule or govern or to make policy choices, but to judge how well their elected officials are doing it and to vote them out of office if they're not doing it well enough. Popper and Hayek agreed that the primary virtue of democracy is that it has institutional mechanisms that enable people to remove their political leaders from power without violence and bloodshed. They agreed that democracy concerns itself with the process of making collective decisions and achieving collective ends instead of the decisions, the actual decisions we are trying to make and the ends that we are trying to achieve. And they agreed that large societies are seldom able to agree about the ends they want to achieve because their members have very different concerns and values and beliefs and interests and goals. Popper and Hayek also agree that democracy should be concerned with limiting the powers of government, that an unrestricted or unlimited rule of the majority could lead to tyranny, and that talk about the public interest or the common good is usually a rhetorical device that people use to persuade other people that they should agree to some policy that they themselves favor. And that it typically belies the fact that the people whom they want to persuade do not regard the policy in question as either a common good or in their own interest. Finally, Popper and Hayek agree that the proper use of majority rule is to facilitate collective decisions. That using it in this way may help us to make decisions and resolve disputes that we otherwise might not be able to make or resolve. That the more political majorities use it, majority rule, the more that political majorities use it as a tool to achieve their own goals, interests, and ideological ends, the more political minorities would feel tyrannized by it. 
and that the more political minorities feel tyrannized by it, the less effective it would be in helping us to make collective decisions or to resolve disputes we might not otherwise be able to resolve. So these are major agreements. But for all this, Popper's concept of democracy is very different from Hayek's. And this difference has important implications when it comes to the concepts of open society. Hayek regarded himself as a proponent of both limited democracy and liberalism. But he was more committed to liberalism than he was to democracy. He taught that liberalism believes in limited government, in the limitation of all powers, in a law that is the same for all people, and in the elimination of any and all legal privilege. He said that liberalism came to be closely associated with the movement of democracy and that in the struggle for constitutional government in the 19th century, the liberal and the democratic movements indeed were often indistinguishable. But he also said that democracy and liberalism are ultimately concerned with different things. Hayek said that liberalism is concerned with the functions of government and particularly with the limitation of all of its powers. And democracy is concerned with the question of who is to direct government. He said that liberalism is a doctrine about what the law should be, and that democracy is a doctrine about how to determine what the law should be. Hayek said that democracy entails nothing about the specific aims and goals of government and that liberalism is but one among many political doctrines that are compatible with it. He said that the opposite of democracy is authoritarianism, that the opposite of liberalism is totalitarianism, and that neither one of these excludes the other. So that an authoritarian government may act according to liberal principles, and a democratic government may wield totalitarian powers. And he said that the liberalism may accept majority rule as a way of deciding what the law will be, but not as an authority about what the law should be. Hayek thought that it was the gradual expansion of the powers of democratic governments and the majorities that direct them that led to the fission between democracy and liberalism and to the rise of what he called dogmatic democracy or the idea that majority rule is good in, in itself and should thus be extended as far as possible. He thus distinguished the liberal democracy that he supported from the dogmatic democracy that he opposed. He said that liberalism is concerned mainly with limiting the coercive powers of all government, whether democratic or not, whereas the dogmatic do democrat knows only one limit to government, current majority opinion. Hayek said that dogmatic Democrats think that as many issues as possible should be decided by majority rule, and that liberals believe there are definite limits to the range of the questions it should decide. Hayek noted two ways in which dogmatic Democrats thought democracy could be extended. The first was by increasing the number of people who are entitled to vote, and the second by extending the range of issues upon which they can decide to vote. And he pointed to limitations that liberals might place on the extension of the right to vote, not only to the usual limits pertaining to age, citizenship, and criminality, but also to more controversial and disputed limits, such as denying the right to vote to government employees and recipients of public charity. He said that democratic and liberal traditions agree that decisions ought to be made by the majority whenever state action is required, but they differ about the scope of state action that should be guided by democratic decision. And he drew a distinction between liberal democracy and unlimited democracy. Unlimited democracy is closely related to dogmatic democracy. The two, however, are a bit different. Dogmatic democracy is the belief that majority rule should be extended as far as possible. 
An unlimited democracy, on the other hand, is a system that actually does it. Hayek described it as a form of government in which any temporary majority can decide that any matter it likes should be regarded as common fares subject to its control. He thought that democracy in the West had devolved into unlimited democracy. And he called it an abomination. He thought that only limited government can be decent government, and it would seem to follow that only limited democracy could be a decent democracy. He thought that we should take the first step from limited democracy to unlimited democracy when we move from the belief that only what the majority approves should be binding on all to the belief that whatever the majority approves should be binding on all. And he said, it is not democracy or representative government as such, but the particular institution chosen by us of a single omnipotent legislature that makes it necessarily corrupt. This idea that unlimited democracy is necessarily corrupt is not a critique of democracy per se. Hayek's whole point is that the not, democracy need not be dogmatic or unlimited. But it is a damning critique of democracy as it has developed in the 20th century. Hayek thought that the separation of powers was the greatest and most important of the limitations imposed upon the powers of democracy. And that it was swept away by the rise of omnipotent representative assemblies that operate with unlimited powers that enable them to do whatever their members find expedient to do in order to be reelected. And he thought that this had destroyed liberalism's ideal of the rule of law and government under the law. Hayek wrote that democratic decisions in such assemblies rest upon a state-sanctioned process of blackmail and corruption. That it is easy for legislators to withhold their support even from measures that they would otherwise approve, unless their votes are rewarded with special conceptions to that group. And that majorities in democratically elected assemblies with unlimited powers can be formed only by conferring special benefits upon certain groups, thereby buying their support at the expense of certain minorities and imposing special burdens on others. Hayek, so far as I know, never used the term market democracy. But I think that it aptly captures two different aspects of his thinking about democracy. For it describes what he thought a true democracy should be, namely a form of government that supports and protects markets. And it also describes what he thought democracy has become, namely a marketplace for peddling political power and influence. Hayek did not think that this is the nature of democracy as such, but he did think that the majority of a representative assembly must, in order to remain a majority in such a system, do whatever it can to buy the support of special interests by granting them special benefits. And here, I think it's clear that Hayek's commitment is not so much to democracy as it is to liberalism. Indeed, Hayek is committed to democracy only to the extent to which it enacts liberal principles into law and implements them in practice only to the extent to which it protects and preserves liberalism's vision of individual freedom, and only to the extent to which it supports and protects free markets. But if Hayek thought that democracy is concerned with the question who should rule, Popper thought that Plato had set Western political philosophy on the wrong track by asking that question in the first place. Popper thought that we have little choice once we ask this question, who should rule, but to answer the best, or the wisest, or the most virtuous, 
and that this only leads to endless arguments about who the best and the wisest and the most virtuous among us might actually be. More important, Popper thought that the question, who should rule, is to ask the wrong question. He thought that democracy is, above all, a set of institutions designed to protect and prevent against the rise of dictators, dictatorships, and dictatorial rules. Or in other words, a system of government with institutional controls to prevent tyranny and the rise of tyrants. And that any system designed to prevent tyranny and the rise of tyrants must thus have institutional controls that enable the ruled to dismiss their rulers. He thus thought that the most pressing problem in politics is not who should rule, but how to get rid of the rulers who are corrupt or incompetent or just not right for what we need them to do. Popper thought that the problem of how to get rid of one's leaders is implicit in the very nature of government and that it is a utopian fantasy to think that we can solve this problem by getting the best or the wisest or the most virtuous. He thought that the power that the best and the wisest and the most virtuous acquire by being elected to public office is a legitimate power that they must have in order to do the things that we have elected them to do. But he also thought that the best and the wisest and the most virtuous are also human and would thus tend to be corrupted like all the rest no matter how good or wise or virtuous they may once have been. Indeed, the futility of this approach can already be seen in Plato's Republic. For Plato is very clear that the philosopher king, who will rule or who should rule the Republic, must be chosen for his devotion to truth and his inability to tolerate falsehoods in any form. And Plato was just as clear that the very first thing the philosopher king must do, once he becomes the philosopher king, is to tell the noble lie. Popper said that the people who approach political theory with the question who should rule generally assume that political power is unchecked or unlimited and that rulers can thus do whatever they want to do. He said that if we assume that the rulers can do whatever they want to do, then who should rule might well be the only question to ask. But he also said that once we begin to limit political powers, we can approach political theory from a somewhat different angle and ask a very different and far more useful question. Instead of asking ourselves who should rule, we could ask ourselves how can we organize our political institutions in a way that will prevent bad and incompetent leaders from doing too much damage. Popper said that we need to distinguish between two and only two forms of government, democracies and tyrannies, and that the difference between the two is that democracies have institutions, such as elections, that enable the people to dismiss their leaders without violence and bloodshed. He said that it is democracy's institutional check upon tyranny and violence and not its ability to elect the best or the wisest or the most virtuous leaders that is the primary reason why we should value it. If we conceive of democracy in this way, we can begin to see it less as a political tool that enables people to get what they want and more as a way to avoid dicta dictatorships and tyrannies. We can, in other words, begin to see it less as a market for political exchange and more as a system of controls that prevent people and groups from acquiring too much power or from imposing their views too much upon others or from staying in power too long past the time that the people who put them in power would have liked them to leave. Here, we could pause for a moment to reflect upon two ironies that emerge from Popper's and Hayek's views about democracy. We've seen that neither Popper nor Hayek were advocates of unlimited government or unrestricted majority rule and that they instead agreed that political power should be limited, that majority rule should be two, and that rulers should not be able to do whatever they want to do. But we've also seen that Popper believed that the idea that democracy is popular sovereignty 
and majority rule is a myth. And that Hayek believed that it is not only real, but debilitating in the hands of dogmatic Democrats and others who favor unrestricted majority rule and unlimited democracy. So it's a bit ironic that while they largely agreed in their opposition to unlimited democracy, Popper argued that majority rule and, pop and popular sovereignty and hence unlimited democracy do not really exist. And Hayek argued that we actually have too much of it already. The second irony is a little more subtle. Dogmatic Democrats would clearly reject Hayek's critique of unrestricted majority rule and unlimited democracy. For unrestricted majority rule and unlimited democracy is, after all, what dogmatic Democrats regard as real democracy. And very few of them would agree with Hayek that we are anywhere near reaching their goal of achieving it. So they might, for this reason, actually regard Popper's idea that popular sovereignty and majority rule are largely a myth as a point in favor of their own critique of democracy, which, simply put, is that majority rule and, and, and popular so, uh, sovereignty are largely a myth. But Popper, unlike the dogmatic Democrats, was very far from offering his idea that popular sovereignty and majority rule are largely a myth as a critique of democracy. He offered it instead as a critique of what he regarded as a common but incredibly naive concept of democracy and as an attempt to understand democracy instead of idealizing it. Popper was very clear that majority rule is an institutional mechanism that might be useful for avoiding tyranny and dictatorship, but he was also wary of the possibility that it could easily devolve into a tyranny of the majority. Hayek, of course, also worried that unrestricted majority rule and unlimited democracy could devolve into a tyranny of the majority. And this, I think, is the second irony. From what follows, I will argue that it was not so much the possibility of a tyranny of the majority that worried Hayek as it was the possibility of a tyranny of the wrong majority. The term tyranny is most often used to mean a cruel and oppressive government. It was used that way in the past, and we will use it that way here too. It is important, however, to understand that Popper used it in a somewhat more classical sense to refer to a government that cannot be removed without violence and bloodshed regardless of whether it was cruel or oppressive. What makes a ruler a tyrant, according to this view, is not that her rule is cruel or oppressive, but that she is not and cannot be reined in by any law other than her own. This is because tyrants do not recognize or submit to any law other than their own, which means that they do not recognize or to submit to any law at all. Here it does not matter whether tyrants seize power or, ele or are elected by a landslide vote. And it does not matter whether the people love them or hate them. What matters is that tyrants cannot be held accountable to any law or indeed to anything other than themselves. What matters is that tyrants at some point or another and in one way or another proclaim themselves to be above the law and that nothing prevents them from doing so. Once a tyrant consolidates power, which she does once again by no one preventing her from doing so, there is no nonviolent way of removing her from power so long as she wants to stay. This, once again, is because tyrants do not recognize or submit to any law other than their own. Here, the essential thing about democracy is not that it has a nonviolent way to make power transitions. Every monarchy has that, even when there is a problem in producing an heir. And any tyrant may decide to cease being a tyrant without violence and bloodshed by abdicating the, their position. 
The issue, on the contrary, is whether there is a nonviolent institutional mechanism for removing or dismissing or firing a government, and for doing so in cases in which the people in power do want and did not want to go. Popper said that democracies have such mechanisms and that tyrannies do not. The Greeks thought that democracies have a tendency to devolve into tyrannies and that when a democracy devolves into a tyranny, it typically does do so in one of two ways. The first is through the rise of political majorities that use their political power as majorities to ride roughshod over the rights of political minorities. The second is through the rise of charismatic leaders who either pander to their electorates or are able to exert undue influence through the force of their personalities. The historical record yields examples of tyrants who came to power in both these ways, but in either case, it was thought that democracy's descent into tyranny was due to the flaw of flaw in democracy itself, to the fact that it caters to the will of the people and thus tends to become too liberal, as the majority elect leaders who are, at least at first, place no limits on their freedom. Far from bowing to the popular will of the people, the Athenians would actually ostracize political leaders they thought likely to become tyrants. They ostracized them not because they did not like them, but because they thought they posed a threat to their democracy. And here, it's at least interesting to note that the Athenians would force them to leave the city not because the people or the majority were opposed to them, but because of their popularity and charisma and influence they might exert over the majority. They feared that the people or the majority liked them so much they make uh, that they may bestow power upon them for life. Hayek was also concerned about the rise of tyrannies. And he was especially concerned about how the pursuit and attainment of an absolute collective purpose can lead to totalitarian democracy. He agreed with Popper that the purpose of a true or proper democracy is to prevent this from happening. And he proposed reforms to our legislative structure and to our electoral system that he hoped would prevent it from happening. Popper agreed with the Greeks that democracies have a tendency to devolve into tyrannies, but he thought that if and when a democracy devolves, it always devolves into a tyranny for the simple reason that he thought there are two and only two main forms of government and that the one that isn't democracy is a tyranny. There is, however, a long tradition stretching back to the Greeks that there is actually a paradox of democracy, namely that the majority of a democratic electorate may, in full accordance with democratic principles, actually decide to vote about against democracy and elect a leader or tyrant as their leader. Popper thought that the paradox of democracy shows a logical flaw in the very idea that democracy is ruled by the majority. For what if the majority in a democratic state decided to do away with its own democracy and install a dictator instead? What, in other words, if it were the will of the people that the people should be ruled by a tyrant? And what if the people in their freedom decided to give up their freedom? These are not just abstract or academic worries. For the majority in a democratic state could decide to do away with its own democracy and its own freedom, perhaps, for example, by electing its leaders for life, and many democratic majorities have actually done so in the past. The people may not have conceived of what they were doing in quite this way when they did it. They may have thought that they had found the best or the wisest or the most virtuous, and they might as well double down on a good deal and elect them for life. But history is rife with examples in which this sort of utopian thinking did not quite work out the way it was planned. Popper thought that the idea that democracy is majority rule leads to self-contradiction and that we must reject it 
if we want our theory of democracy to be self-consistent. For majority rule says that we should reject any rule but majority rule. But it also says that we should accept any and every decision that is made by a majority. And if the majority now decides that the tyrant should rule them, then proponents of majority rule are caught between a rock and a hard place. For they simply cannot reject any rule but rule by the majority and at the same time accept any and every decision that the majority makes. But Popper thought that we can avoid this paradox if we simply reject the idea that democracy means majority rule and think of it as he did, as a form of government designed to defend society against tyranny and dictatorship. He thus thought that elections are not democracy itself, but merely well-tested and reasonably successful safeguards against tyranny and dictatorship. And he thought that if a majority vote someday destroyed democracy itself by electing a tyrant to office, then it would simply not be because democracy is inconsistent, but because there is no infallible or foolproof way to protect it. Hayek thought that unlimited dogmatic democracies are essentially tyrannies, and that the rise of omnipotent representative assemblies enable them to do whatever they need and to retain support of the majority. And this means that majorities are subject to no law besides their own, and that this in turn means that they rule for all intents and purposes as tyrants. That, that was Hayek's view. He thought that we had to find a way to bring government under the rule of law to rectify this situation. And he actually proposed a model constitution that he thought would do the trick. Hayek's idea, in a nutshell, is that true democratic governments must be restrained by laws that they did not make and could not change. Such laws might be laid down by some majority, but they could not be laid down by a current ruling majority. And the current rule, ruling majority must be unable to change them. Hayek thought that this restraint upon majority rule and the power of the majority, the inability of the current ruling majority to change the general laws and rules of just conduct under which it lives, is necessary to bring a democracy under the rule of law. And he thought that it would also prevent it from devolving into a tyranny of the majority. Now, I think that these ideas are in sharp contrast with Popper's concept of an open society. And in what follows, I want to explain why. Open society is very often associated with democracy and democratic, political, judicial, and economic institutions, such as free elections, the rule of law, and the free market. So it's not too surprising that many people regard them as one and the same thing. Popper himself, however, associated open society with human freedom, fallibilism, and respect for other people and their ideas. He thought that democracy is the form of government best suited to protect an open society, but he also thought that open societies may have non-democratic governments, that democracies are not always successful in protecting them, and that there is always a reactionary movement towards returning to the security of a, oh, really, of a of a closed society. Boy, okay. Um, there are, of course, no such things as the open and the closed society. There are only societies that are open and closed in different ways and to different degrees. I will, nonetheless, speak of them as a societal type that actually actual societies may approximate. And I will, in what follows, first explain Popper's vision of an open society by distinguishing it from democratic institutions with which it's often confused. I will then explain how Popper thought open and closed societies differ, and I will then explain his vision of democracy by distinguishing it from an open society. And in point of fact, I actually have no time to do any of that. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is to very quickly explain why I said earlier that 
Hayek's electoral reforms would transform a pauperian democracy into a tyranny. Remember what a tyranny is for poverty. It's a form of government in which you cannot dismiss the leaders without violence and bloodshed. They just won't go with under law. Now, Hayek was concerned with a very different problem. Hayek was concerned with the problem of the representatives pandering to their electorates for their votes in order to get reelected. And he thought that because of that, basically, uh, the, the electorate could get anything they wanted through market democracy. And so he wanted to solve this problem. And he thought of a way of doing it. Hayek thought that actually, if you were to elect the representatives once and only once in your lifetime, at the age of 45, at which point Hayek thought you would be mature enough to be able to judge the best and the most virtuous in your society and to elect them to office. And if they were to serve for a period of time of 15 years or so, so they get to the, the age of 60, then this would solve the problem of pandering to the electorate. And it probably would. It would also, however, incur a new problem. Because remember, Popper thought that a democracy is a form of government in which you have institutional mechanisms that enable you to remove your leaders, to fire them without violent bloodshed. You are really. And I, I'm sorry, I am the tyrant by proxy. You are a tyrant, yes. No, but by proxy. Okay. It's not me, it's the organizer. And what, and what Hayek's system gave you was a system that had no way in which you could remove your leaders. You could elect them to office, but you could not vote them out. You could put them into power, you couldn't fire them. And of course, there are all sorts of other things connected with this, which lead towards tyranny as well. Imagine an electorate that voted once and only once in its lifetime. This meant that it would lead, you know, lead uh, that it would live maybe 60 years of uh, their people's lives with under leaders that they did not put into office. I'm going to stop there and I'll let you ask more questions because I have plenty of time for questions, don't I? Yes, Thank you.